So we have Richard Isset, and his topic is intraoperative immunoadsorption, facilitating antibody incompatible heart transplantation in children. So thanks for giving me the big words to say. <laughs> I'll keep it simple, you know. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, if you're wondering what the mad Englishman's wearing, this is actually for a bet. So I've got 75 bucks for actually dressing up like a bit of a prat. But that's regardless. So basically, this is the combination of about 10 years worth of uh, work. So kind of for me, it was a bit of a labor of love because you know, you've got to be, you know, you've got to love something to do it for this long. Um, I haven't got any other conflicts of interest or anything else, um, only that I'm really honored to be able to, to talk to you about it. A little bit about Great Ormond Street itself. So uh, we're an international uh, center of excellence in uh, child health care. Uh, I'm quite proud to say it's actually considered one of the world's leading children's hospitals. We have 63 different specialties. Uh, we treat about 240,000 uh, outpatients and 40,000 inpatients a year. Um, and our specialties include cardiac surgery and transplantation, pediatric intensive care, neurosurgery, cancer, nephrology, and, and renal transplantation. Um, as a cardiac, sur uh, cardiac surgery unit, we're uh, the largest of only 11 pediatric centers in the UK. Um, we do around 550 to 600 open heart procedures every year, um, and we're only one of two uh, pediatric transplant programs. Uh, we've got pretty good rates, of, as you can probably see, in both the under-16s and the over-16s, um, so we're very proud of that. Uh, we're very research orientated and very research heavy. So the perfusion department itself, we, uh, we've published about 50 papers over the last 10 years. So it's one of the sort of biggest um, outputs for us in terms of the, in the UK. Some of this is obviously what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I want to start by almost echoing what Ashley just showed uh, and what we see in the UK. And it's, this is interesting. So this is the data from COVID-19. So you're looking between 2020 and 2021. And despite COVID-19, what we actually saw was a consistent number of thoracic transplants across the, the, um, uh, the, the two centers that we have in the UK. Um, this masks the fact that actually the transplant waiting list has risen by 45% compared to the time the year before. Um, and it's actually risen from only 15 to 20 patients in the last decade. And the data, you know, essentially demonstrate that the waiting times for these children is in excess of 12 months. Um, and, you know, our urgently listed patients are required to wait approximately th uh, three months for a heart. If we fast forward a year, so this is the uh, 20 to, to 2022 um, in April, we've actually got demonstrably worse in terms of uh, the, the parameters that we have now. Our non-urgent heart restrictions have actually increased by another 55%. So that's a massive increase again. Um, and the median waiting times have risen from 414 days now to 762 days for non-urgently listed patients and from 88 to 193 for our urgently listed patients. And, you know, if you're an OBA group as well, you're actually seeing a, uh, you know, as a non-urgently listed uh, transplant candidate, you can expect to wait over 975 days, which is a, a phenomenal amount of time that we, you know, we have. Um, and we know that there's an exponential decay in the chances of, of survival uh, in, you know, with increasing time on the waiting list. So, you know, to, to state the obvious, we simply don't have sufficient um, hearts to go around and not of the right size, and not of the right blood groups. So we need to work to a uh, method to obtain, that essentially allows us to take any organ that we can for any patient. But of course, it's not quite that simple. And there's lots to do about the functionality of the organs and whether it's DCD or DVD, as Ashley quite kindly said in the last excellent talk. But regardless of the cause, actually, we turned down around about 65% of all of the donated organs that we are offered. Um, and with so many children waiting for a new heart, you know, this is something that you, you, can't, you can't continue with. We have to find a way forward for this. And we've heard about the OCS, which is obviously one of the things we're looking at, you know, trying to get the marginal um, functionality that um, organs sorted. But what about where an incompatibility exists between the donated organ and the recipient? You know, what can we do for those patients? Um, so one of the major barriers to uh, heart transplantation has been, rather than is now, the uh, ABO blood group system. So we all have antigens that are present on our cells that essentially uh, our immune system determines self from non-self. And the antibodies that recognize those are known as isohemoglutinins. And whilst if you're a uh, group AB um, person, you will never develop any of these antibodies, the rest of us develop them over varying periods in our childhood. 
Now, in the late 90s, Professor Laurie West and her team from Toronto Sick Kids actually exploited this lag in high gluten in production uh, to alleviate the number of children uh, waiting for heart transplants. Because they noticed actually up until about 40 months of age, antibody production was low enough to you know, attempt what they call a mismatch or ABO incompatible heart, which, you know, with a low risk, uh, low risk of hyperacute rejection. And what their work showed is not only was it possible, but it, it actually reduced waiting list mortality by 51%, uh, 51% which was you know, a phenomenal achievement at the time. And over the last 30 years, we are, our understanding of the immune system and how it matures has, has you know, obviously grown eventually. And we're now doing ABO and compatible heart transplants for people up to their about four years old all around the world. But it wasn't just a case of actually being able to do it with low um, titers. What you've also got is the fact that in, to ensure a minimized chance of hypercute rejection, the Canadian team developed what they call a, a threefold plasma exchange technique in the 30 minutes preceding bypass for the actual transplant. So the patient would be cannulated, the native circulation would be drawn out of the venous line and discarded, while at the same time, you would simultaneously pump it through a one-to-one -one ratio, which was three times the circulating volume of um, the uh, blood and blood plasma to match the, uh, to match the uh, recipient, so you didn't have any cross-contamination in terms of the antibodies. But there was a lot of issues with this. One is that you know, we all know that blood stocks are very, very low. So when you're using liters of blood and, and plasma, that causes an issue. Um, and if you've ever done one of these, when you ring up in the middle of the night to the blood bank and say, I need two liters of red cells and two liters of this, uh, they start calling you very rude names. And what it meant was that there's a physical limitation essentially to how far we could push this technology. And that goes up to about four years of age or about 15 to 16 kilograms. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the conversion. Um, otherwise, I'd tell you that as well. Um, but the, yeah, so like the impact to blood stocks is, is massive. But also, you've got a patient whose heart, by its very nature, is you know, failing. And in this whole setting, you are now using the patient's circulation to hold them together whilst you do this plasma exchange process. And if you get it wrong, there's a lot of chance of hemo um, hemodynamic instability, and you don't get your isohemoglutinin reduction down as much as you think, then what happens is you end up with a higher risk of hyperacute rejection. Um, and when one considers, you know, who should be eligible for these sort of incompatible transplants, it's interesting to see there's quite a wide variation depending on, on where you live um, and, the, and the guidance for who is actually uh, is suitable. And actually only in the last three months, and, you know, thanks to the data we've been working with and a lot of centers in the US, that has changed. So the OPTN now say that you can test anybody under the age of 18 with their eyes of human gluten in titers. And if they are going to be low enough, you can then offer them a uh, ABO mismatch. And that was going up from just two years old. From this. So there's a massive step change. But it does present its own problems. You know, who's going to sanction the use of tens of liters of blood and plasma for these older patients? And, you know, which manufacturer is going to make a low volume number of reservoirs that can take that much volume? It's just not going to happen, is it? But despite these limitations, we know that the plasma exchange process works and it's been successful for many years. And you, know, you can show an equivalence in terms of survival from both compatible and incompatible transplants. But we started thinking, well, there, there must be a better way to do this. There's got to be a way that we can improve what, what is there already. Uh, and so for this reason, back in 2014, uh, we started investigating the use of interoperative um, immunoabsorption. Now, immunoabsorption itself has been used for um, ABO incompatible renal transplantation uh, for, for several years, but remind, it relies rather on multiple treatments in the run-up to the transplant, uh, you know, which is obviously known and planned well in advance. And you know, whilst that can work for an elective transplant, when you, you know what's going on, you can measure the titers, and if it's not right, you come back again, and you, know, you can do multiple um, steps. Heart transplantation isn't like that. You know, often we don't know, you know, we know have about eight hours between finding there's a heart available and then putting it into the patient. So it's very unpredictable and that does not lend itself to sort of treating, you know, potential recipients regardless of the imminency of their transplant. And if you do this in the, uh, you know, the early stages and then don't worry about when the actual organ comes about, you're going to likely get a reaccumulation or an increase in isohemoglutins again. So the only way to combat that is to give immunosuppression pre-transplant immunosuppressed patients don't tend to do very well. So this is not a good idea. So we thought, well, actually, forget doing it, you know, months ahead of time. Let's actually just put this in as part of the plasma exchange, uh, sorry, part of the transplant process itself. 
And so what we did was basically, you know, you know, laboratory setting is basically work out that we could spur off from the systemic circulation, separate the plasma from which we can then remove the isohemagglutinins, recombine it with separated red blood cells to form antibody depleted whole blood, and then return all that to the systemic circulation. Um, and so therefore we, de we designed the experiment to sort of simulate a clinical scenario using um, expired red blood cells and commercially prepared red, um, fresh frozen plasma or, or octoplasm. Um, and if I can just digress for sort of one moment and sort of give you advice on research. If you ever do anything like this and you're going to set up a mock circuit where you're reliant on blood or plasma, my bit of advice would be involve more people than you think you need. Because I made the mistake, uh, which I thought was the right thing to do, is I spoke to one person in our blood bank thinking, if I do that, everything's going to go fine and, you know, we can sign off and else. And I went to the head of the service. So I thought, well, I can't, you can't get much better than that. So we got everything set up, and she said, absolutely, we'll give you expired red blood cells, that's the way to go. And so we set a date and said, that's when we're going to do it. What she didn't tell me was that day was the day after she retired. And on the morning that we were planned, got, it, got everything ready to go, I actually rang the blood bank, and they knew nothing about it whatsoever. And we were told the, no, you're not having any blood. Step forward, the hero of the moment. So it's at this point I'd like to give credit and thanks to my ex-colleague, David McGarry, who uh, donated his blood in order for us to take this um, <laughs> experiment model on the day in question. Um, the poor guy actually arrived in the office carrying a tray of donuts and a load of coffees for the team. Um, and then when asked what blood group he was, he you know, stupidly admitted to being you know, O positive. So he got shoved in the chair, stabbed in the arm, and told not to move for about an hour. Um, you know, we, we were not complete, you know, animals. We, we did get the training to make him a cup of tea. Um, but in, well, in, in it was tragic, really, but, and very sadly, he, he never actually got to eat one of his own donuts. Um, but anyway, so we, we set up this experiment, and then we supplemented his blood with the plasma from down in the blood bank that you could buy commercially, and that then obviously raised the antibody levels even higher. And the process that we set out was basically down to, because we knew how long we could run these things in terms of how much plasma there was, and also the rate at which we can actually do the experiment based upon the rate going through the column. Uh, and so we used fluorescence activated cell sorting or fax analysis. And um, that's to you know, look at the binding of IgG on the left and then IgM on the right uh, to the ABO antigens themselves on commercially repaired red blood cells. So if you use fluorescent labeled secondary mouse anti human antibodies, basically it sorts the number of cells binding antibody uh, so through the sequential treatments of plasma. And then we used, you know, no blood cells as negative controls and then uh, commercially repaired group A and group B red blood cells incubated with you know, anti-A and anti-B antibodies as a positive control. Um, now, before becoming a perfusionist, I actually was, uh, I trained as a geneticist. So I, you know, I was quite happy to go back in the labs and get my hands dirty with this. Um, and you can tell how long ago it was because my eyesight was a lot better then. I haven't got the... Um, the, the silver streaks, shall we say, that's uh, there. So it's obviously before children. Um, and in fact, I think it was actually before I got married, you know, judging by the fact I look happy. Um, and also I'm doing something I know how to do without actually being told how I should do it. Yeah, anyway, um, so we used that, and we also used an antibody titration technique known as gel microcolumn hemagglutination. And so what this allows is the sort of cross-validation of two techniques. And so what you can see here is basically a consistent linear decrease in antibody titer with each plasma volume that we treated. And so in basically, in summary, all these different types of data just showed us that we could take the antibody levels down to a, a level which would mean that we could do transplantation within the time frame that we would normally consider um, usual with cardiac transplantation, so about two hours roughly. So this is what it looks like in, in practice, um, and you can see the immunosorption uh, column highlighted here. Um, and then in 2015, this became our, our standard of practice, and we, we published it in the Journal of Heart-Lung Transplantation. Because it's very, very predictive, actually what we could do is use what we call this ready reckoner. So this is a way that we can not only you know, look at what patients we can treat and how, how high their antibodies can be, um, but it just allows us to then gauge timings as well as anything else. And so having done this, we thought, well, we, we believe that actually th this system will remove the size limitations for the patients we have, because we're not now reliant on all this blood and plasma. And therefore, we can expand the recipient pool for ABO compatible heart transplantation. Um, and actually, when this paper was published, we actually were you know, really honored to get a, a you know, accompanying editorial. And you know, it was broadly supportive of what we we're trying to do, but it came up with four elements that they thought that we needed to sort of prove, that, you know, to sort of validate what we were saying. So the first one was the fact that actually you need to be able to you know, show that you can expand this donor pool whilst at the same time halving the amount of blood or more that you're giving. So getting rid of that plasma exchange process, does it, is it actually ineffectual? 
The second thing is that we know that the, you know, the outcomes for these patients are very, very good. So if you're going to do this, you have to show that actually the um, rate of uh, rejection is the same, the survival is the same, and there's no antibody reaccumulation. So it's got to work as good as the sort of gold standards it were. So I uh, actually pulled out then all the data we've done on all our ABO mismatches for, you know, from was it January 2000 to June 2020. So this is both plasma exchange and also our immunoabsorption column. And then looked at basically you know, what was the reduction in, in blood product usage and you know, what was the you know, sort of equivalence, if you like, in the instance of rejection episodes. Um, so you know, I'm talking about you know, some biometric data tomorrow. And so I put out a lot of data from our EPIC system. So we've got things on you know, patients' episodes, admissions, ward stays, lab results, transplant records, biopsy reports, everything else. Um, and then basically I used open source tools and I would like to this point to say, you know, it's just because I want it to be transparent and reproducible. Um, but actually, if I'm honest, um, I'm just a geek and I got bored during COVID. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll teach myself how to code. It might be a bit of fun. Anyway, we need to make it do. Um, it's, not, <laughs> it's wet in England. There's not much else to do. So anyway, we published this back in the uh, Journal, of Heart and Lung uh, Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation a year before last, I think it was. Um, and it, you know, I'm going to scoot over a lot of the stuff that we did, but if you want to know more information um, or you know, kind of how, what the results mean, we actually then did the uh, November podcast. Uh, so you can always give that a listen. And apparently that's really good for insomnia. The, you know, so when you look at the patients that we've done, and if you actually consider those that we treated with immunoabsorption, so the first thing you can see is actually 60% of the patients that we're now treating are over four years old. And that's the first thing. And the second thing is that actually we're possibly discriminating for those patients who have got a no blood group, who are the ones usually disadvantaged by this, this process, uh, by, you know, com uh, compatible transplants. And moreover, actually, you can see that seven out of the 10 patients that we treated with immunoabsorption were actually on some form of extra support, mainly VAD, prior to, immediately prior to the transplant. So, you know, it gives you an idea of the, the disease process and how far they were along. If we compare to the plasma exchange, you can see that the age range obviously is significantly higher. That's, that's fairly obvious. Um, and then, although it didn't reach significance, probably due to the fact that there's uh, you know, just a small sample size, you know, we did see an increase in the number of patients on, on VADs. Now, often it's, you, know, you can describe the data using a table. It's very difficult to actually visualize what it means. So this is, gives you a sort of broader understanding of what that actually happens. And so you can see that we're still treating that peak of patients at around sort of nine months of age. Um, but we're able to now extend that out to over eight years old. If you look at the, in terms of the interoptive data, you can see that the you know, bypass time is actually significantly longer in the immunoabsorption group. Now, that's actually a bit of a misnomer because actually a lot of these kids are on VADs, therefore we put them on bypass to a dissection in that point. But also what you don't include there is the fact that the plasma exchange happens for 30 minutes prior to the, you know, the, the time of being put on, on the pump. So it's, it's not quite as it seems. Well, what was very interesting and probably not surprising, given that we've gotten rid of the plasma exchange process, is that we halved the amount of blood products that these children were receiving in theatre. Like I say, well, we knew we were going to do that because that's the whole point of it. So, so what? In the post-op period, so when these patients got back to ICU, their units there, so if we discarded everything that we use, so that we would have had in the plasma exchange, these children are getting half the amount of blood again. Nothing to do with the plasma exchange. This is, you know, in the ITU afterwards. And there's this sort of evidence that actually transfusion begets transfusion. The more you transfuse, the more you have to transfuse. And because we're not transfusing them, they don't need it later on as well. So we've got a sort of double whammy of, of what we're doing. Now, in terms of the actual um, antibody reduction, we're looking at whether or not you can reduce it and whether or not it rebounds as well. And so, you know, we use two things because when you do with any transplants, often you get the, the night of transplant, you'll have a isohemoglutin titer. And they say that's the starting point. That's a snapshot. That's not everything that we know. And titers actually go up and down throughout life. So what we did was actually look at peak and, you know, um, levels, both pre and post-op, rather than that immediate um, pre-transplant titer. Um, and then again, being geeky, we used a sort of mix effects regression model because actually we want to know Mul there's multiple testing, so we're looking at sort of multiple, um, multiple measurements and, and just see what's going on. And actually what we saw was that there was a significantly higher anti-B maturity in the, um, the immunoabsorption group, which is not really surprising because they're slightly older, their immune systems have developed a little bit more. But what was interesting is that actually in the same follow-up period that in the plasma exchange group, we'd actually seen some you know, low-grade but incidences of high re well, rejection, both at the cellular and antibody-mediated stage. We weren't seeing any of that in our immunoabsorption group. 
which is really interesting. And I'll you know, note that because we'll come on to talk about that a bit later. So none of them needed retransplantation or anything else like that. And you know, nobody died. So you, know, you, you can't say much better than that real than that one. So when we looked at it, and this was capped at five years from when we first started, there was no difference between this method, the plasma exchange method, or even compatible transplants. So we know that it's good. We know that it works. Um, and I use something called a Peter Peter waiting. So you put you know, essentially more data on the front to just see if there's any small changes. And because uh, you know we've got a, an older group of patients in this immunosorption group, you say, well, what about age? You know, younger patients surely might be at a higher risk. So would you expect to see more, more mortality in the plasma exchange group, who are obviously younger? And actually, when we did this, so you know, Cox proportional has regression, looking at age and outcomes. Actually, what we saw was the opposite was true. The older you are, the, the lower the, you know, your survival rates, which was quite interesting. So it was completely opposite the way around that we, we thought. So, you know, to answer the questions for that, you know, yes, we can do exactly what we said we're going to do. We have half the amount of blood. We've, you know, doubled the age range um, that we can actually treat. There's no different in terms of antibody reduction, and we're not seeing any reaccumulation. And we know that actually the you know, survival is excellent. And these are arguably sicker patients than we'd seen before. So this is what the sort of data say. Now, I'm going to try and show you what it actually means. So here's an example. This is Lucy. So Lucy was 18 months old when she was diagnosed with a rare form of restricted cardiomyopathy. Uh, when she was four, she was listed for transplantation. Um, but because she was no blood group, um, and you know, she's obviously very small, and you can only have a donor twice her size, uh, what she, you know, she actually remained on the transplant waiting list for three and a half years. And so we were actually, and it, literally, discussing her for a VAD implantation, and the phone rang saying, we've got the right size, but it's the wrong blood group. Now, we'd done a couple of these by then, and we just thought, let's do it. This is her best chance. And, you know, during this time before that, her quality of life was shocking. So she couldn't walk from the car park into her own school. She couldn't do any peer lessons. You know, she couldn't, she didn't actually go to um, birthday parties on trampolines and that kind of things because she couldn't. So, you know, and it's, you know, when you work with the kids, you realize just how much of that you kind of take for granted if you've got healthy kids of your own. And that, that was their life. Their life didn't include any of that. So, you know, it was, it was very sad. But, you know, hopefully we thought, well, if we're going to do this, we shall, we shall see what happens. This is her six months after a transplant. Quite a remarkable change. And that's one of the things that it gets. But what we actually did because of looking at this, we actually involved our comms team. Um, and that's the second piece of advice. If you are doing any sort of research that has an impact, especially on patient care, get involved with those guys because actually they can help you. And actually what we did was get her into the newspapers and the else because she became the oldest child in the world to ever have an ABO incompatible heart transplant. Um, and she, yeah, she was, you know, like newspapers on the news and she's now able to live life as a, you know, normal child. Um, and actually she made up for lost time by going and climbing an Italy and, uh, sorry, mountain in Italy last summer. Um, but when we had this interaction that we probably wouldn't have had otherwise, you might write up a paper and then leave it at that. We talked to the family and then sort of really understood what, what we'd done and sort of where the impact came. And that was actually by shortening her weight for an organ, which we kind of knew, but we don't think about. And they were saying that they don't think they could have waited much longer because they've already been waiting three and a half years. And it is quite a, you know, it's not a, not a great thing to go through. So I thought, well, okay, well, I'll go and analyze the, um, the waiting lists and actually the organ donor office that we have and just see, well, when would her next organ have come up? When would a compatible organ up? We knocked her 14 months of her weight that she would have had if we just had a compatible transplant. And we wouldn't be able to do this with the plasma exchange. So that would have been her life. And if you think, well, you know, we were looking at putting an AVAD into her. Complications from VADs are horrific. Um, and the chances of her surviving that long um, are quite low. The chances of her getting a complication are very high. And also, if you've got super urgent additions, that would have bumped her down the waiting list. And so that number could have been a lot, lot higher. But it, it, it then prompted us to say, well, what's the, what's the impact of incompatible heart transplantation in terms of you know, outcomes, but also health economics? Um, and I'll address that in a second. But since then, actually, it's been really lovely because the, the sort of method has now become viewed by a lot of centers as gold standard. Um, so we've actually had uh, a center in Lund in Sweden. They've done their uh, two heart transplants using this technique. Um, we've got the center in uh, Valencia in Spain. They've done the uh, bilateral um, lung transplant using this technique. And then sort of most recently, the team in Bad Oeynhausen in, in Germany, they've done their first ever incompatible transplant using this. Um, and they said the reason why was because they were looking at the plasma exchange and just thought this is going to be 
too difficult to do. And so they liked the fact that they were doing this. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to one or two people around the room today. So there are other centers in not only Europe, but North and South America, Asia and Australia who are now trying to get their stick neck up and running. And if you don't want to talk about this and grab me and we can discuss it later on. Now, we were saying, you know, what's the impact of compatible transplants and how does this make up sort of a portion of what's going on? And so if you look at the uh, International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation sort of records, you see that actually, um, based on the data between what was it, January 2000 and July 2018, we see that based on average, you do about 30 to 35 ABO transplants every year. Um, and that number is actually steadily increasing, but actually lung transplants are, are staying relatively stable, but that, that's fine, we can see that. But as part of the actual total, this only makes up about 1%. And you think, well, actually, okay, and we know that it's making a big difference to some of the patients, but how much of a difference is it actually making in reality? And, you know, like Lucy, we wonder what difference it was making to other child's wait times and, you know, what it meant economically, like I said earlier. And, you know, I've already demonstrated that, you know, the rate of decline of these organs was about 65%. But how much of this is down to actual incompatibility between the um, donor and the recipient? rather than just, you know, marginal hearts and not, not got a function. So I got in touch with uh, our NHS blood and transplant unit. So this, these, these are the guys that obviously uh, organize all the transplants and all the heart offers. And basically, I got all the data for the decade between 2010 and 2020, with the idea we wanted to answer a very simple question, which was, well, how much longer would all these children that we've done, so there was about 20 um, ABO mismatches that we'd had in that time, how much longer would they have had to wait to get a compatible organ? Um, and we thought, well, okay, that's, that's fine. We'll have, we'll have a look at that. And I was lucky enough to work with a you know, brilliant medical student, so Shoji Jamel, who went th painstakingly through all this data to see what was going on. So they used, we used Captain Meyer estimates basically to say, well, if we started now, when would they, they have it? For group A's and B's, you're reducing the amount of time by a year on, on, in median. And for your group O, it's over two years. And in fact, one of those patients would have had to wait another five years for a compatible organ to become available in an institution. And economically, the numbers are, are rather astonishing. So if a very conservative estimate would be that it takes about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds a day to support someone on a ventricular assist device. And 11 of the patients that we had there were on those devices. So if we just looked at those, just those 11, and you think about how much it would be for those to be supported until they're uh, compatible transplants, just those 11 patients would have cost between 10 and 14 million pounds. It's a staggering amount of money that actually we're saving by doing this. But also with all good data, it's complete rubbish because actually these patients are very unstable. You know, they are very likely to be you know, alive sort of two years down the line, even when they have um, you know, a valid part. But the other thing of looking at this was that we discovered that you know, incompatibility is actually a real issue with this. So 9% you know, of all the organs that were offered are refused due to incompatibility. And it's not just the ABOs, it's something called human leukocyte antigens or HLA antibodies as well. So you know, in essence, you've got your anti-HLA antibodies, which are like isohemoglutinin on, on steroids. They are the most potent source of hypercute rejection that we have. Um, and then we thought, well, can we start now looking to deal with these? Uh, so just to give you a sort of sense of scale. So this is the genomic region for all the ABOs. So you can have slight variations, so group A1 or A2, for example, but you can either be A, B, A, B, or O. That's fine. And the genomic data that uh, makes up this is 18 kilobases. So, you know, quite small, only short arm of chromodome 9. This is the HLA system, slightly different. It's the most polymorphic region in the human genome. It makes up 3.78 megabases of genomic data. And at last count, there were 37,068 variants. So an astonishing number of things we have to look at. Now, generally, the HLA system determines self from non-self and acts through three main mechanisms, and all of which end up with uh, cellular uh, destruction. Now, that's fine. That's all very academically interesting. But what's that got to do with us? Well, that comes in the idea of sensitization for you know, patients when you look at transplantation. And synthesization refers to the process of antibodies that are against potential uh, HLA molecules on the selected donor. So if you have any exposure to non-self HLAs, they cause the production of HLA-directed antibodies. And these allo antibodies recognize um, what they call antigenic epitopes, which are short amino acid sequences um, that are displayed by the HLA molecule and it, on the transplanted or allograft itself. And that will cause hypercute rejection um, and you will, um, you know, leading to death. There are three main mechanisms that we actually produce them, one being um, in pregnancy, so you react to them. 
if you put in the VADs, you cause HLA antibody uh, sensitization, and also if you give blood transfusions. So how do we treat children with heart failure? Well, we put them on bypass, we give them blood transfusions, and we put VAD in. We're causing a problem. So why is this such a big issue? Well, if you look at the proportion of patients that have these antibodies, the more antibodies that you have, the higher the population that you are compatible with. And this, we know, it means the highest likelihood of either not getting a transplant at all or hypergroup rejection afterwards. And sensitization can therefore cause these sort of longer waiting times and finding a donor can be incredibly difficult. And sadly, many of these children, up to about 30%, will die waiting for transplant. It's not something that, you know, I, I can sit by and, and sort of go on with. But we thought, well, there's got to be a way to sort this out. So how can we, how can, how can we do something about it? Now, we were... Fortunate, unfortunately, actually, uh, we had a patient come in for a bilateral lung transplant. Um, and as the patient was coming into the anesthetic room door, we were told that there was HLA antibodies. That's not the time you want to find out there's a problem. So what we did is basically take our, our uh, ABO system, but with just a plasma separator, and said, well, we're going to take out all that plasma and just see what happens. Um, and this was published in Perfusion last year. Um, and from a practical viewpoint, managing that is probably not, not, not particularly easy because you're removing all the heparin-bound anticoagulant 3 so there's a chance that you're going to clot off when you're putting all the plasma back in, and you're still using lots and lots of volume. Um, now, what was interesting is in the post-op period, I mean, it's nothing to do with the, the actual uh, transplant itself, but they got uh, CMV and um, epstein barr virus, and it caused a massive surge in their donor-specific antibody production. And this was despite having full immunosuppression on the thing. So you're thinking, well, hang on, how does this work? How, how can we have this system? There, there must be a better way to, to do this. Um, and so for the past two years, with funding from the British Heart Foundation, I've, that's exactly what I've been looking at. Um, unfortunately, you can't just swap out one column for another. It won't work like that. So you know, you're going, it will get saturated because there's so many of them and go bang. Um, and it tends to make the surgeons a little bit jumpy. So we thought, well, let's look at else, what else is around. So there are immunosorption columns made to treat um, rejection. So you use them in the post-op period. Um, and what this does is use a what they call two-column uh, two regenerative method. I'll explain what that means in a second. But essentially, these, um, these columns use a, a synthetic cyclic molecule that binds all IgG and, um, immunocomplexes. And it's about 1.2 grams when it's fully saturated. So basically, I know that we can make you know, separated plasma reduce the bypass machine. So I went back to the, the drawing board and said, well, why can't we just implant that as part of our, our process. And so it's very similar to the ABO system, apart from two uh, differences, which are the fluid bags that you can typically get here by the blue and the green. One is an acid and one is a buffer. And so what happens is that you have this, I say the two column regenerative method. So one treats while the other one sits in stasis and waits. When that becomes uh, saturated, it swaps to the second column. And that starts doing the absorption. The first column is then stripped using an acid, buffered, ready to go again. And it just flips between the two. So that's how you can do as much as you need to do. And you can see how it manages itself in terms of the pressures and flows and everything else. And we said, right, okay, well, we've got a way to, to, to do this. Um, and then after a few iterations and you know, a certain amount of whopping of uh, you know, walls and floors and then trying to curb after myself, this is what it looks like in, in practice. Uh, now, there are obviously some ergonomic issues in terms of it's not the smallest thing we've ever had in the operating theatre, but, you know, needs must. But again, nobody's ever attempted to do this again, so I had to go back to the... Um, the, the process that we started with and get an ex vivo model. Uh, and so basically we just got HLA compatible blood um, from our NHS blood, you know, blood and transplant units and then sent up a, uh, a circuit which was designed to replicate a patient coming for transplants and then proceeded to treat it with absorption for about three hours just to see how it went down. Uh, and then having done that, we used what they call a single bead luminex assay, so that gives you an idea of antibody binding, and then flow some of it cross match using uh, donor lymphocytes. Uh, so we published this last year in Perfusion, um, and it's, it's been quite good. You know, one of the main practical concerns of how do you integrate two, two aspects? You know, it has to work in practice, not just a case of we connect it up and everything went round. So we tried to do vacuum-assisted venous drainage and whatever else, and looking at whether or not putting it onto the venous reservoir or putting it onto the venous line was the best thing to do. And what we found actually is if you put it onto the venous reservoir, you don't get the venturi effect that you will see in the venous line, and that makes it better just generally, and even in the presence of ventricular assisted vac uh, vacuum. Sorry. Um, so we basically said, look, look, it works. With clear fluid going around it, we can sort things out. But does it work? So we got this blood, and actually comparing it with the you know, guidelines produced by our transplantation and history. Um, uh, compatibility in the image genetic societies, we said, well, look, the, the donors we've got would be deemed to be the massive risk of hyperacute rejection. 
So we've got the right stuff to have a look at it. And so we then went ahead and did it. And so all the testing was done at the um, uh, our Bart's laboratory, our transplant laboratory. Um, I went over and got my hands dirty again, which was good fun. But basically, these sort of scatter plots are just at the allelic level. So these are different um, groups of antibodies, and we're looking at the reduction that goes on during that period. And so across all experiments, you could actually show that you're bringing down these antibodies below the threshold of hypercute rejection with that um, vertical, dash, uh, sorry, the horizontal dash black line in the time typical at our unit, at least, to see the um, time for transplant, which is that vertical dash black line. And when you m copy that with the previously donated um, lymphocytes from organ donors, we saw that actually the antibody binding changes as well. So you go from being positive, i.e. it's binding antibody and it's causing hypercute rejection down to we, it's not binding the lymphocyte at all. Therefore, there is no risk of hypercute rejection. And when I put it with the Luminex assay again, you saw exactly the same thing as we saw in our sort of ex-fever model that actually you would get in these um, antibody reductions really quite quickly. I won't go too much into detail, but essentially you got two methods that we used because obviously we're not going to see every variant that we, there is in the HD system. We, you can't. So we used two machine learning models basically that then looked at how we could reduce it and how we could then predict how long it's going to take. If you want to know more details or anything else, please come and find me later on. But in the interest of time, I'll just go ahead. But basically what we were able to demonstrate is then that all the variations, no matter what their starting point, we could actually reduce this down um, under the transplant, under the um, curve, if you like, for hypercute rejection. And the idea of this is that those models are now, I'm sorry, I'm creating this like dashboard or interactive app, so that is going to be something that we will use on the night of transplant to assess donor organs, um, but also then to guide us how long we need to take and where we are on that curve. So that's, I'm currently building that at the moment. Uh, future works, I won't go too much into it, but um, we are expanding. We've shown that actually we can put two ABO columns in and we're running them in parallel, which means we can double the amount of time uh, that we got, so we can halve the amount of time that we take or double the amount of, uh, the, of the size of patients, which is going to be useful for, essentially for the big ones. Um, and as well as I mentioned earlier, the fact that actually we're not seeing these, these uh, hypergeek rejection episodes or you know, at least cellular rejection episodes. And we think there's something that the immunoabsorption column is doing that's actually in, in, uh, impacting the inflammatory reaction as well. So we're going to look at that. And the final bit of work that I'm putting in as a research fellowship at the moment is that we're going to, we, we focused on trying to make the patient compatible with the organ. And now we're going to try and see if we can make the organ compatible with the patient, looking at making sure that we're not, you know, reducing, you know, we're reducing, sorry, the uh, white blood cell count and, and having a look at that that comes out of the donor. So to very summarize then, you know, although it's a very small proportion of the total number of transplants, actually you, know, you can see that the economic impacts of incompatible transplantation are, are huge. Um, and you know, by pushing the boundaries in terms of the ABO system and then applying that to HLAs, we've, we've now doubled the donor pool and also recipient pools that we're able to treat. So which means that actually a lot of these children are now having the ability to have a transplant a hell of a lot quicker than they would have done. Um, and getting to where I want to be, hopefully before I retire, which is we can use any heart for any child and, and get these patients treated. Um, and I just want to thank all the people that worked with me for the last few years trying to, trying to get this sorted, uh, but most especially my uh, wonderful transplant team who are, you know, are brilliant at looking after our, our patients. Um, and I'll finish on that. Uh, so thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them.